welcome to Le Bon Mot, a podcast about language learning by ACA, a language training school based in Quebec, Canada. This podcast is designed for people who are learning languages, and each episode will cover a different topic connected to language learning. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Britta Potion Reader. I've been teaching English as a second language for over 10 years, and I'm learning French and Spanish. Language is my passion. This week, I'm joined by my guest host and colleague, Clémence Grisson. Clémence is part of the teaching team at ACA and has a bachelor's degree in English literature, along with a master's degree in English studies and a master's in journalism. She's taught ESL in France and Quebec and has a deep understanding of the difficulties of mastering pronunciation in a second language. We're going to be talking about pronunciation, a topic that is important because it helps us to be understood when we're speaking a language, and it can also be challenging for language learners. Today, we're going to provide you with a practical guide to pronunciation of key aspects of English and French. We'll look at ED endings and word and syllable stress. Let's get started. Clémence, welcome back to Les Bon Mots. It's nice to see you again to talk about pronunciation in English and French. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be back. Let's dive in. The first topic that we're going to tackle today is one that a lot of English learners have questions about, and that is ED endings. That is the ending that we apply to regular verbs in the simple past. So, for example, when I put the verb walk in simple past, it becomes walked. The verb warm would become warmed. And the verb wait would become weighted. What makes these two little letters so tricky for learners? Well, as you just demonstrated, one of the things that's tricky is that it's the same two letters, but you have three possible pronunciations, like a t sound, uh, like walked, or the d sound, like in warmed, or like id, which is a whole extra syllable in the word, like in weighted. So it's a little bit easy to get confused about how to pronounce this ending as a result. It could really help our pronunciation and our clarity for people who are listening to us when we can make the correct choice. So how do we know which pronunciation that we can choose? Well, the most important thing uh, to make that choice is actually the last sound of the verb. So I always say that the easiest to remember in the three uh, different sounds we just talked about is id, right? When you add that little extra syllable at the end, and it's when it's at the end of a verb that ends either with a t sound or a d sound already. So you have no choice but to add that extra syllable. So for example, the verb hate, it becomes hated, or the verb need, it becomes needed. That does sound like it's a pretty straightforward one for those two sounds. What do we do about verbs that don't end in t or d sounds, t or d sounds? So here uh, you have to uh, start thinking about the difference between uh, voiceless uh, sounds and voiced sounds. So that gets a little technical. I know you're uh, pretty good at explaining this, so I'm going to let you take that one away. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think about, let's start maybe with voiceless sounds. Mm -hmm. We call it a voiceless sound because when we pronounce it, we just use air to make it. We don't use our voice. These sounds are usually quite gentle sounding. It sounds like the sound of s, the S, or the letter F, f or letter combinations like S, H, sh, or C, H, ch. So I'm making this sound only by using the shape of my mouth and by moving air. I'm not using anything in my throat to make this sound. So if I put my hand right on my voice box on my throat, I won't feel any vibration when I make the shh sound or the f sound. And in fact, if you're listening to this podcast in privacy, for this part of, of our discussion, I encourage you to try it out to see if you can feel the difference between the voice sound and the voiceless sound. Verbs that end in the voiceless sound 
the ed ending is t. Now, if we notice, t, Clemence is t, uh, a sound that's voiceless or voiced. Let me try that out. T, t. I don't feel any vibration, so I'm guessing it's a voiceless sound. You're right. So if the verb ends in a voiceless sound, we make a voiceless ending for it. Let's come back. A verb like push, sh, is the last sound. When I make it into simple past, I add the t sound pushed. That's so interesting. What I usually like to say for this is also to think about an intuitive approach to it. Because if I try to say push and add a d sound, it doesn't come naturally, right? Push d. It's not actually an easy transition to make. So that's something that I like to think about when I think about those differences as well, is that the sounds have to almost come naturally. So it makes sense, right, that those sounds in that same category would flow uh, pretty well one into the other. I really love the way of thinking about it in terms of intuition, because as you say, if you try to apply the d ed ending sound, to a word like kiss, kiss d, it doesn't sound good. It sounds really funny and it'll catch our ear. So I really love your intuitive approach. So we've talked about the words that end in voiceless sounds. We use the t sound for the ed ending. That leaves us with the voiced sounds. What ending do we apply to those? So for the voiced sound, uh, we have our little d sound. It's our last remaining sound. And as you demonstrated before, you talked about the difference between voiceless sounds that don't produce any vibration in the vocal cords. Well, uh, for the voiced sounds, as the name indicates, you do use your voice to make those sounds. So if you put your hand on your larynx, you'll feel it vibrate when you make these sounds. For example, uh, a sound like b or l or n. Those sounds, if you put your hand on your larynx as you pronounce those, you're going to feel the vibration. And this includes other sounds like v or z, w sound, any of these other sounds which are left, and there's quite a lot of them. These are all voiced sounds. Uh, could you give us a couple of examples, maybe just to help people understand what it sounds like in context? So for example, if you have the verb claim in the past tense, it will become claimed. Or if you have a word like play in the past tense, it will become played. And once again, for these, I still like my intuitive approach because if you reverse it and you want to say something like claimed or plate, of course, the word plate is a word, but it means something quite different. So it doesn't feel quite natural to create that harsh t sound after those lovely little soft voiced sounds. So this is usually the, the sort of distinction that I give of trying to identify the sounds. It's a much less technical distinction, but having that idea of sort of a softer sound versus a harsher sound, ch versus m for example. And I encourage students to try and apply the sound to sort of flow into the sound that they think sounds best. And usually, especially if you, you know, listen to a lot of English in your practice, which as teachers, we always recommend, I think people tend to have good reflexes when they really start thinking about it. But of course, when you're speaking, it's easy to make mistakes because you're just uh, trying to string your ideas together. But generally speaking, when you start connecting those sounds, it actually makes a lot of sense. I couldn't agree with you more. It's really challenging when you're learning pronunciation, if you're trying to memorize a list of which sounds are voiced, which sounds are voiceless, if you're able to sort of identify the patterns that you hear and begin to develop your ear for what sounds natural and what doesn't, that will really help you a lot as well, because you're not always going to be carrying around your list of voiced and voiceless sounds with you as you go about your day and be pulling it out of your pocket to refer to in the middle of your conversation. So I love your intuitive approach. I think that that's super useful for anyone who's learning a language.
Let's move our focus from one part of the word, in this case, the endings that we've been talking about, to a topic that can involve whole words or even sentences and can affect meaning. This topic is stress. But in this case, when I talk about stress, I'm not talking about anxiety or a negative emotion, a feeling of too much pressure. Clemence, what do we mean when we talk about syllable and word stress in language learning? So when we talk about syllable stress, we're actually referring to the part of the word which is pronounced more strongly. And so generally it's this idea of having extra emphasis on certain syllables in the word. And people usually perceive that as a longer syllable, right? The syllable is pronounced uh, longer or with more of a spotlight on it. And syllable stress in English is extremely important because it really helps listeners understand what you're saying. And sometimes you could even get away with maybe not pronouncing sounds quite correctly, but if the overall stress pattern of the word is respected, you might get away with it. People might still understand you. And it's quite different, that aspect between English and French, isn't it? Yeah, it is actually. And this is something that was a little bit of a surprise for me, I guess, in a way, because in my head, I always felt like French did not have syllable stress in the same way that English did. And then I, I did some research and generally in French, what happens is it's the end of the words that are stressed or that are longer. So for me in English, in the way that I perceive it, the stress in English is more of like a spotlight of, ooh, this uh, syllable is the star of the show, you know? And then in French, it's more of a question of length right? Like this syllable drags for a little bit longer. And so it's a little bit different the way we relate to it in French, because I would say overall that it is more important in French to really get the, the syllables right and to get the sounds right when you're pronouncing if you want to be understood. Stress is not going to be quite as helpful in that sense, or syllable stress is not going to be quite as helpful in that sense. Neither is the regular kind of stress very helpful when you're trying to pronounce something correctly. <laughs> and syllable stress can be stressful if you're trying to figure it out. <laughs> this was a revelation to me when I learned about this, Clemence, because as an Anglophone learning French, I would often wonder why sometimes people wouldn't understand me when I was pronouncing a word, let's say 90% correct, and maybe one sound would be wrong. And in my mind, I was accenting the word correctly with the appropriate stress at the end of the word. And still I would get confused looks. And I realized that when I dug into it, really the pronunciation of individual sounds is going to help Francophone listeners understand much better than syllable stress. So this is a major difference between English and French in terms of how much information we get from syllable stress as to what a person is trying to say to us. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Syllable stress in English can affect meaning in some ways when we're looking at individual words, can't it? Yes. Uh, one example that we often talk about is, you know, the difference between verbs and nouns, where typically when you're looking at two syllable verbs or nouns, depending on where the stress falls, is going to in most cases, we're always very careful not to say that something is a rule because English, but in most cases, it's going to give you an indication of whether that word is a verb or a noun. So if we look, for example, at the word present, to present something like, oh, I have to present the results of my study in front of the group. But if it's my birthday, maybe I'll be lucky and I'm going to get a, a present. Right? And so here you see that in the verb, uh, the syllable that we hear the most, present, to present, is the second syllable. Whereas in the noun, the syllable I hear the most, a present, oh, thank you for this lovely present, is the first syllable. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole group of verbs slash nouns that fall into this category. We could think also another example of dessert, meaning to abandon or leave. 
that verb, and the noun desert, a sandy place that we associate maybe with sand dunes and cacti and things like this. And this is why I always say you can't fully trust those rules because you can also think about the word dessert like, ooh, I'd like to eat something sweet at the end of my meal. And of course, this one's an exception. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's got that extra S. Mm -hmm. My little trick, here's a little mini extra trick. If you're trying to remember how to write desert versus dessert, the sandy place versus the sweet treat at the end of a meal, Deserts are full of sand, so they have one S, and desserts are full of sugar and spices, so they have two S's. Oh, that's nice. I like it. Never thought of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of these little tricks we learn as kids growing up trying to spell English words. It's not easy, so our teachers sometimes give us these little memory tricks to help us with that. I know that numbers is another area where even sometimes between native speakers, it can be difficult to differentiate which number we're saying. And that's really down to syllable stress, isn't it? When you're thinking about, for example, the number 13 versus the number 30, especially if someone is speaking quite fast, you might not be sure, right, which one they said. And so one trick that I often give my students is to try and identify where the stress falls, right? Because 13, the stress is going to be on the second syllable, the syllable stress. So I have uh, 13 candles uh, on my cake, which is a lie because I'm actually 30. So the uh, stress in that case is on the first syllable, right? 30, so 13 versus 30. And a lot of other of those number pairs do the same thing, 14, 40. 1550. So we can follow this same pattern to help us be understood when we're speaking and also to understand what number the other person is saying. Is your son 14 or is your son 40? I think sometimes it's important for people learning English to know that when we have an incorrect stress pattern, it can be a little bit distracting at times. So In my business English classes, I often hear the word manager, and it always takes my brain a little second, a little extra second to process, oh, manager. So I hear it pronounced with the stress on the second syllable, manager, but as a native speaker, I would pronounce it with the syllable stress on the first syllable, manager. And this is a little bit similar. I, I don't know, Clemence, do you ever hear your students say develop? Well, that's the, exactly the example I was going to say. Develop is such a common one that I hear all the time. And what I usually give them or show them is this famous or infamous, <laughs> I don't know how you want to look at it. Uh, there's a video of, I think his name is Steve Ballmer. He used to work at Microsoft and he is at a conference and he's I'm not entirely sure what his intention was, but he's screaming to the crowd and he's like trying to get people excited. And he's like, developers, 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 developers. And everyone is like cheering. And it's a, you know, I'm guessing a developer's convention. But I love that video because you really hear the stress because that's another thing that I've noticed. It's not always easy initially for people learning English to really identify syllable stress, especially because it's not necessarily something they're used to thinking about or they're used to correcting or, or focusing on. And so I like when I have examples where it is very clear that one syllable is the star of the show, you know? So with this video, especially, developers, developers, developers. It's very, very clear. And this is definitely one of the mistakes I correct all the time. Sometimes when I'm teaching about syllable stress, because as you say, it's not as important in every language or as perceptible in every language, there's sort of two models I think that people can use and they can choose whichever one works for them. So I think some people hear it as long and short, like you mentioned before. So a word like develop, the vel is stretched longer. So da is quick, vel is stretched, and up is short. Develop, da, da, da. But other people, I think, hear it more like uh, music, you know, develop, bum, bum, bum. You know, a rise and a fall. So in my brain, I see it more like the music way where 
I can envision like a little mountain in the middle of the word. So I think however people want to conceptualize it, there's different ways we can think about it, but we do have to think about it in some way. Exactly. I completely agree with you. For me, it's really much more of a musical thing. And often those are references I'll use with students or even, you know, like the Shakespearean pentameter, like to be or not to be, you have this sort of, you really feel that rhythm uh, of like ups and downs. So I completely agree with you. I perceive it like that more. But as you said, whatever works, (laughs) as long as you're making it make sense to you, and as long as you're developing that ability to perceive it, because it's very hard to produce something you cannot perceive. So you do have to sort of train your ear to recognize it, identify it in order to be able to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. It's crucial. So we've been talking about the stress that's placed on different syllables in an individual word. That's an important aspect of stress. However, there's another aspect of stress that happens at a macro level when we look at an entire sentence. So when I look at an entire sentence in English, some words will be emphasized more than other words. And I think this is not only an English thing. I think this is this is often the case. But there are a few times when the way that I stress words in a sentence can also affect what people can understand. It's kind of a strange phenomenon, isn't it? It is, yeah. I always like to talk about stress kind of as a indicators, like little labels on words, you know, so generally speaking at the level of a sentence, the words that are going to be stressed are lexical words, right? Words that have meaning. Whereas as a general rule, grammatical words, words that I refer to as bricks, you know, they're there for the structure, but they don't necessarily, if you use them alone without a context, you're not necessarily associating them to anything. Those words as a general rule will maybe not be stressed. So that's where stress is so important because for the person listening to you, it gives an indication of where the important words are, if we can say it like that, right? The words that are going to carry meaning. And one place that I know this gets really important, and again, this is not just for people who are learning a language, but this is something that sometimes native speakers struggle with when they're talking between each other, is with the words can and can't. Could you shed a little bit of light on these two words and how the stress in the sentence affects our understanding of them? I will definitely try. So with can, it's an example of what I was just saying. With can, generally speaking, it's going to be reduced. If you listen to our first episode about pronunciation, you'll be familiar with the schwa. What that means is that the vowel in can is reduced. So I'm not pronouncing it can, like a a can of tomatoes. I'm pronouncing it can. Oh, I can do that for you. I can do that for you, right? So it's reduced, it's smaller than it would be if the, if it were stressed. So in that case, it's not stressed. Whereas if I'm saying that I can't, I'm going to emphasize that more. And so in that context, there is going to be more emphasis on the word. And I might say something like, I can't help you with that. I can't help you with that. And so the T is not always what really helps us understand it because sometimes it kind of merges into the next word and you might not hear it that much. So it's really how the vowel is pronounced generally that's going to be a helpful indicator. It really makes a difference in meaning. So thanks for breaking that down. And that's something that sometimes when people are on the phone with each other, even if both of them speak English very well, they might be like, wait, you you can or you can't? They might have to do a little check. Same thing with 13 and 30. Sometimes we need to do that little extra check if we miss it, just to be extra sure. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned being on the phone because we tend to forget sometimes that the words that we say are quite a small portion of communication in terms of what is understood. Um, So definitely for can and can't, being able to see the person I think is very helpful because that person might uh, shake their head or, you know, you might have sort of uh, body language cues to also understand a little bit better. And for sure on the phone, that would be more challenging and you would really, really have to pay attention exactly to what sounds that person used. 
Yeah, you don't have the clue of seeing them shaking their head no as they say, I can't help you with that. Exactly. Or looking sorry, you know, like, oh, can't help you there. <laughs> exactly. Clemence, earlier you mentioned that in French, the stress tends to fall more to the final syllable and it tends to really be perceived as a lengthening of that final syllable. But it's not really the full picture, is it? Well, I mean, you're definitely right. The The stress tends to fall at the end of words or at the end of phrases. And what's interesting there, I guess the main difference between French and English is that with English, stress depends on each word, right? Each word is going to have a different stress pattern. So you need to know, we mentioned before, manager or develop, right? You need to know where the stress falls. Whereas in French, that's not quite the case. In French, uh, as a general rule, it's going to be the last syllable of the word that is stressed. But as we mentioned before, with French, I really think about the importance of individual sounds. And there's this famous scene, and of course it is extremely exaggerated, but there's this famous scene in Friends where Joey's trying to learn French for an audition and he's being coached by another character in the show and she's saying maybe like a je m'appelle Claude and he's repeating the individual sounds, but then at the end when he says the sentence, he says, je blah blah dee. And it's completely unrelated to what she told him, but he's just kind of repeating the pattern of, or the pace, I guess, of what he hears. The sounds are completely disconnected to the original sounds he's trying to repeat. So of course that's a caricature, but definitely I would say that individual sounds matter a lot when you want to be understood in French. And another thing that I was thinking about in terms of big differences is that in English, again, you don't really have a choice with where you're going to put your stress. It's determined. There are certain rules sometimes, lots of exceptions, but it, it is where it is. And you don't really have a choice with that and you can't really change it. Whereas in French, you might sometimes do something where the stress kind of shifts and that's where we get into maybe a little bit more question of stress versus tone. But when, for example, if I want to say, you know, I'm insisting and I want someone to do something now and I say, non mais je veux que ce soit fait maintenant, maintenant. And I'm really stressing the first syllable of that word, even though generally I would say, oh oui, uh, je, je fais ça maintenant. Right. And maybe it sounds like the end has more of that sort of stress. Whereas if I think about this in English, where I want to say I want it done immediately, immediately the stress is on the second uh, syllable mm -hmm. of that word. Even if I'm very angry, I cannot <laughs> say I want it done immediately. Right. That doesn't sound quite right. I'm doing something to the word that is not allowed. Um, so that's another interesting uh, difference, I would say, where stress perhaps in French is less categorical <laughs> than it is in English. Whereas in English, you just you have to know where it falls. And as we mentioned before, a lot of that knowledge comes from repetition, being exposed to the language, sort of perceiving that rhythm and reproducing it. So I, I think that's one interesting difference between the two. It's good to know that we can play a little bit more with the syllable stress in French, but we just have to make sure that we're making the sounds that someone's going to be able to understand. But it's really fun to have that aspect of expression that we can bring into our speech in French. We can move the stress around to convey different feelings. It's interesting, too, that you talk about feelings because I this came up in class very recently where a student of mine told me that a previous teacher had told him when he speaks on the phone, so he's a francophone, and his teacher had told him that when he speaks on the phone, it's very important if he's answering a customer in, in English, that he puts more emphasis in his sentences like that. There's more almost dynamism in his sentence. And I think that's a, maybe a, a perceived difference between French and English, where French has a tendency to be 
flatter in its structure and the way that people speak. Whereas English, again, we really hear those highs and lows. And so if you pick up the phone and you say, hello, my name is Paul, how can I help you today? In a very flat tone, that's going to sound a little odd and it's not going to convey the right sort of energy. And of course, in French, you would want to have some energy as well, but it might not come across through word and syllable stress in the same way. If I were Paul in English, I would expect him to say it more like, hi, this is Paul speaking. How can I help you? Where we're really hitting the word stress on how can I help you, right? It's, it's much more up and down. We talked about the mountains and the valleys. Here, you're really driving through the Alps or the Rocky Mountains or something when you're, when you're answering the phone in a customer service situation. You've got a lot of that up and down in your voice. And probably people even notice it when we're speaking on a podcast. We also add that little bit of extra expressiveness to our voice because we can't see our audience. So we have to convey our emotion through other means. Absolutely. And it's definitely something that you can do in French too through tone. But again, a rising tone is not necessarily the same as syllable stress, right? So if mm -hmm. I say, bonjour, comment puis-je vous aider? I'm asking a question. So I have a rising tone, but that's not necessarily the same as stress, which would fall on a specific part of the word. So mm -hmm. that's, it's mm -hmm. interesting to explore sort of those variations in the language and how, as you said, how that impacts our expressiveness. It also makes me think when we think about sentence stress, the video clip, and you could find it on YouTube, of My Fair Lady, when the woman with the Cockney accent is learning how to speak in a more posh British accent, a sort of more upper crust kind of accent. And she has to learn the, the phrase, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. Something like this. I, I forget the exact wording. I think that's exactly it. I love that movie. And I love the play by George Bernard Shaw that it was based mm -hmm. on. And that's one of the examples that I use a lot as well. It's exactly that, you know, like, again, she could not say the rain in Spain fall, you know, like there's a specific rhythm to that sentence that is connected to the stress pattern of each of those words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the stress pattern of the sentence itself, right? Which words we choose to stress as well as which individual syllables we choose to stress. So it's kind of like two layers. You've got the word stress as your first layer, and then you've got to build the sentence with emphasis on the appropriate words as well. But don't panic. This is something that comes just naturally through practice, through a little bit of feedback and through paying attention to what you hear and listening to how people are using language. So as you mentioned, that kind of input of listening is really important to helping us understand these aspects of, of English or of French. How do people give that extra flavor? How do they give the, the emotional context, the feeling to what they're saying when it's not coming through the kind of pronounced syllable patterns that we have in English? So it's good to be uh, linguists when we're watching TV. I absolutely agree. I often joke in class that, you know, we studied this out of passion. And so I get excited about teaching phonetics because I'm a teacher and this is what I do. And I have an interest for that. But there's definitely, a, again, a very intuitive way to go about it. And it doesn't have to be technical and it doesn't have to be super specialized necessarily if, if that's not something you respond to very well. As long as you're paying attention when you're listening, as long as you're, again, trying to identify those patterns and reproduce them to the best of your ability, you're definitely going to see some progress. So Clemence, we've been talking a lot about pronunciation this week and every week, as you know, we give recommendations to our audience about things that they might want to check out connected directly or indirectly to language learning. Do you have something that you'd like to recommend this week? I do. I'm a little bit embarrassed about my recommendation this week, so I just want to give a little content warning before we go into it. Ooh, I'm very intrigued now. 
On the French radio, they usually say éloigner les oreilles sensibles, so like send sensitive ears away. Uh, but today, my recommendation is a documentary series that's on Netflix, and it's called The History of Swear Words. So I'm sure you can guess what it's going to be about, and I'm sure you can guess why I gave a little content warning. So definitely a whole lot of swearing on that show. However, I do really appreciate that they're talking to lexicographers, they're talking to neuroscientists to talk about how uh, swearing impacts our brain, the history of some of the most common, most well-known swear words. So I do appreciate the scientific approach, I suppose, and it It's, you know, something that obviously we don't teach in class, but that people will almost inevitably be exposed to in their interactions with their target language. So, you know, it's fun. It's a short format. It's 20 minutes per episode. So don't watch with your kids, but it's pretty fun. After you put them to bed, it's a, a time to maybe further your study of certain aspects of the English language. Exactly. And I mean, there's a former uh, a contributor to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which is my favorite dictionary, which uh, teachers are the kind of people who have favorite dictionaries. So she has a really nice approach to how she talks about language and the evolution of language. And they talk about the sort of social dimension of certain words. So it's really quite interesting. My recommendation is quite in a different direction. So it's nice that we have sort of two very different recommendations to balance things out. For people who are learning French, particularly in Canada, I wanted to bring their attention to a couple of resources that are produced by the Ofi Québécois de la langue française. The first one is the general site, uh, Banque de dépannage linguistique. So this is a website, and I'll link it in our episode notes, which offers linguistic explanations and examples, and the focus is on French and how it's used in Quebec. So what Canadian French looks like rather than a standard or international French, sometimes the same, perhaps sometimes there's some variations. And part of Banque de dépannage linguistique is Le Grand Dictionnaire Terminologique, with various definitions, English translations, and usage examples. So this is something that I really like to refer to when I come across a word that I haven't seen before. And sometimes I can see a variety of definitions and I want the one that it doesn't always fit when I'm looking in a standard dictionary. So I really appreciate the additional context and the translations that I get from these resources. And I'll link to the dictionary, and also the Banque de dépannage linguistique in our episode notes. That's such a great recommendation. I use them all the time. I do a lot of writing, content creation, and uh, they're such a great reference to make sure that, you know, you're choosing the right terms, that you're using the expression and its adequate meaning. They put a lot of effort into it, and, and it's a really, really priceless resource. Clemence, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about pronunciation. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show to tackle some new aspects of this enormous topic. Well, it's one of my favorite topics to talk about, so thanks for having me again. I hope you'll come back in a couple of weeks to talk about a few things we didn't have a chance to look at today. There's always more to say about this. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of this week's episode of Les Bons Mots. Come visit us on our website at lesbonsmots.ca. We have a lot of great content there, including language learning videos and our blog, where we post regularly about news, culture, and language learning. Do you have any questions or suggestions? We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at lesbonsmots at lesateliers.ca or find us on Facebook and Instagram at lesateliers.ca. Reach out to us if you're interested in learning more about our language training programs or if you want to talk to us about ways you can improve your skills. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts to help other language learners find us. Thanks again, and happy practicing.